Hello everybody, this is Mike Bartles from the Hydrologic Engineering Center. This video is a recording of a webinar which took place on July 21st, 2022. The presenters within this webinar include myself, Dave Margo, and Beth Faber. Within this video, we discuss the concept of expected probability, its role within flood frequency analyses, and how an expected probability curve is computed within HECSSP version 2.3. This presentation was made to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, Mississippi Valley Division, Hydrology Statistics and Risk Subcop. Enjoy. We're going to bounce back and forth between uh, all three of us. Dave's going to kick it off um, and give a little bit about the what is expected probability, um, a little bit of the background behind it, its historical context, when to use it, when not to use it, that type of thing. I will demonstrate how it's computed within SSP. I'm not going to give you the gory details. I include them within the slide if you want to see all 14 steps or whatever like that. You can look in the notes and, and check it out. But I'll highlight how it's done within SSP and, and how you can actually do it within the software through demonstration. And then Beth is going to give some really valuable perspective because um, she was the one who was actually in the room, right, for Bulletin 17C discussions. This is always something that's valuable to me to hear about what went on when I was a freshman in an undergrad, right? So this stuff has meaning and, and importance behind it. All right, with that, I'll kick it over to Dave. Okay, thanks. I, I think there's actually, a, isn't there a song about that, right? About Beth in, in the room where it happened, right? Because she was, she was there. So we're gonna, we're gonna kick it off here. This, this is pretty high level because I wanted to Get through the slides relatively quickly and leave plenty of time for discussion. So we'll start off just this is just a visual to kind of calibrate you to what expected probability is and where it comes from, right? So this is a typical flow frequency curve. See the computed curve there is the solid line and the two dashed lines representing the confidence interval. And the, the concept or the question we're trying to answer when we talk about expected probability is um, given that we can, we can look, and you'll see this in later slides, we can look at the uncertainty in two ways, right? We're often used to looking at it kind of vertically, right? What's the uncertainty in flow for a given annual exceedance probability? But we can also talk about it in the context of um, What's the uncertainty in the annual exceedance probability for a given value of flow? And that's kind of the green uncertainty distribution that you see shown there on, the, uh, on this graphical example. So what expected probability really is from that uncertainty distribution of annual exceedance probability, it's the, the mean estimate or the expected value of uh, annual exceedance probability for a given value of flow. So we can calculate, and Michael go over how this is done in SSP, we can calculate expected probability at, at over a range of flows that we're interested in and uh, use that to construct our expected probability curve. Uh, can you go to the next slide, Mike? So this is just a close up of that same concept and that same example zoomed in on the uncertainty distribution. So in this uh, graphic, we're just showing two frequency curves, the computed curve, which is the solid line, and the expected curve, which is the dashed line, and then the green curve uh, representing the full range of uncertainty in the annual exceedance probability at that given flow value. So again, the, the simple definition of it, it's a, a mean estimate or an expected value of annual exceedance probability for a specific value of flow. Kind of why it exists or where it comes from is the fact that this um, uncertainty distribution is not symmetrical. So you have a symmetrical distribution of uncertainty, like a classic normal distribution, right? The median, which is equivalent to the computed curve, and the mean are the same value, right? Because everything's symmetrical. When there's asymmetry in that uncertainty, the mean and, and median are computed are not the same value. Um, so that's why they're different. It comes from this, this um, asymmetry that exists in the, in the uncertainty distribution of annual exceedance probability at a given flow. And what you will find, uh, because of the, just the nature and characteristics of the asymmetry, 
is um, the mean or expected curve will always be to the left of um, of the computed curve when you're looking at floods, right? So when you're looking at, you know, AEPs uh, less than um, 0.5, right, which would be the, the two-year event. Um, so everything shown on this plot, the expected curve will always plot to the left or more frequent than the uh, computed curve. All right, next slide. All right, so core policy. So this has been around for a long time. It actually goes back to before I was born, um, but this is the most recent uh, codification of, of core policy. It's uh, Engineering Regulation 1450, paragraph eight. It's a short paragraph. You can look it up on the publications website and, and read it. Um, I think it's worth, worth reading to be familiar with. Um, but it talks about two methods, and, and myself and I think Beth and probably Mike too are, aren't big fans of the terminology in, in the ER, so I have it in quotes here because I just wanted to be true to the words they used, although I don't think they're the best descriptors of the two methods, but that's just my opinion. So the first method is the frequency-based method. This is, think of this as the way, kind of the way we used to do it and the way we still sometimes do it. Um, and it, it really relates to the uncertainty and how the uncertainty is modeled in your analysis, right? So if you're calculating some sort of um, risk, uh, probabilistic or risk analysis, right? right? Maybe expected annual damages or, you know, the, the probability of levy overtopping or whatever it might be, uh, but you're not explicitly modeling the uncertainty uh, in the frequency curve, they call that the frequency-based method. And the core policy is, has always been, and probably always will be, that frequency curves uh, used in this method should be adjusted to reflect the expected probability curve. All right, next, can you just hit, hit one click? I think there's a second half to this slide. All right, so the second method is in the ER is called the risk-based method. So this came about for the core in the early to mid 1990s. Um, and it, again, it relates to the uncertainty. So when we started explicitly modeling the uncertainty in the frequency curve and in other inputs to a risk analysis, um, using software that you've all probably seen, right? HEC, flood damage analysis, um, the watershed analysis tool, or the RMC's reservoir frequency analysis tool. Um, they all explicitly model uncertainty in various inputs to the analysis, including the flow frequency curve. So when, when you're going to explicitly model it, that uncertainty distribution that, that drives the expected probability curve and the asymmetry in that uncertainty is directly incorporated in the procedures and calculations um, that are used to model the uncertainty. And the output of those are things like, you know, expected values, right, mean estimates. So think expected probability curve, right? So we, we might get out a mean estimate of flow or stage or if, you know, AEP for levy overtopping or, if, you know, uh, expected annual damage, et cetera, et cetera. So those are all mean estimates or expected values and those get handled within the software. So we don't have to do anything special with our frequency curves in terms of how we input them into the model. In other words, we don't need to do the expected probability adjustment uh, when we're modeling the uncertainty because um, the tools handle that uh, internally. So those are the two methods, the two distinctions, despite their the terms, it's really about how and whether or not the uncertainty is going to be explicitly modeled in the risk calculation. Uh, okay, next, sli next slide, please, Mike. In some historical context, so again, I mentioned this dates back to before I was born. Um, Leo Beard, who was... Uh, I think he was, wasn't, he was the first director of HEC, am I correct? Yeah. So he was a, he's a famous hydrologist from the Corps history, did a whole lot to advance the state of the practice in the Corps and the industry in terms of hydrology and um, frequency analysis specifically. But he wrote a paper back in 1960, and the link is there at the bottom. You can download it for free uh, from the internet. I would encourage folks to read it. It's only about six or seven pages. It's a it's a it's a nice read to provide 
just some additional context. But what he said in that paper is that the expected frequency curve serves as a basis for computing the expected return on an investment. So when we talk about how the core does risk and how it does decision making, right? We have historically always done it around um, the expected return on the investment we're making. In other words, the net benefits, right? Um, so that's why the expected probability curve has been important for us historically is if you want, if you want to get the right um, expected rate of return on your investment, you have to calculate it using the expected curve. So from a decision theory standpoint, this is also in the ER 1450, the expected curve is the optimal value to use um, for flood hydrology and related risk-informed decisions. And then Beth can expand on this at the end, but I'll just note here that in Bulletin 17B, there was a little section, I think it was an appendix in the back that talked about expected probability and provided an explicit procedure for doing an adjustment to get the expected probability curve. And as Ann said, that was also available in the FFA software um, that we used way back when. Um, with Bulletin 17C, um, in part because, you know, the core had been doing um, essentially risk analysis for a couple of decades by that point, um, there was no mention uh, of expected probability in Bulletin 17C. Doesn't mean we don't need it necessarily, doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. It just, uh, the decision was just made that it, it didn't need to be mentioned in that specific document. Uh, next slide. And this is, this is my last slide, and this is just a really high level conceptual example um, kind of to highlight why it's important. And there's some nice information in that original paper from Leo Beard that you can read and, and explore and even tinker with if you're so inclined in, in Excel or any other computation tool you like to kind of pr prove, prove this to yourself, right? If you're not convinced, but it's a really simple example, right? If we if we want to build a levy so that it it's you know notionally a hundred year levy, right? Which means it, we want it to have a hundred year level of protection, you know, which notionally means it should overtop once every hundred years, right? If we select the top of levy based on the computed curve, what will actually happen over time? And again, this is kind of an imaginary levy, but over time that levy will actually overtop more often than once every 100 years. So we're actually not gonna achieve our design objective over the long run, right, if we design to the computed curve. If we design to the expected curve, then we'll get exactly what we intended to get, right, which is a 100-year levy that overtops on the long-term average once every 100 years. So there's many layers to that, many more ways you can slice and dice this and look at it, but this is just one simple example to kind of illustrate why the core has always used expected probability and why we believe it's important. If we were if we were going to recommend building a levy to some frequency, um, we want it to perform to that frequency. So the expected curve is the way to do that. And with that, I'm finished with my portion. I'll turn it over to, I think, Mike, who's next. He's going to talk about how it works in SSP. Thank you, Dave. Much appreciated. <clears throat> All right, so the image on this slide here depicts confidence limits and an expected probability curve derived through um, classical bootstrapping procedures. And the reason that I'm showing you this is I'm going to talk about how we actually compute an expected probability curve um, when using the expected limits algorithm and bulletin 17C procedures within SSP. This is the more classical way to think about this process, right? So we have a the median curve, the, the black line in the middle, that's a parameterized distribution, right? Well, if we take that parameterized distribution and an equivalent record length, so the information content that is contained or represented by that parameterized distribution, um, if we randomly sample from that distribution, fit an LP3 distribution to those samples or the things that we, we pulled from that sample, um, we save some data and we repeat over and over and over again until we either reach convergence or um, we hit a, a number of iterations. Um, when we save that information, we can actually derive these things, right? We can look at confidence limits. We can look at an expected probability curve at the end. 
The one problem with doing that, well, there's a couple problems with doing that. First, I should say that that's a random process, right? We need to use a random number generator. We can use pseudo random number generators such that they're repeatable, but it is a randomized process, right? It's rather computationally expensive to do that. And there's also bias within those results. There's ways to get around those biases, biases, but they're essentially considered first order accurate. The results are considered first order accurate um, out of that. We do have another way of getting around that, and this is what we actually use within SSP. So give Dave and Dana Moses all the credit in the world for coming up with this, because this was, this was a really, really good thing. Um, and they called it the I3 algorithm. So it gets around the limitations of the, the classical bootstrap and is considered second order accurate. So I included the list of steps within the slide notes, if you'd like to check them out. They're extensive. Um, there's a lot of nuances to the actual math, but the concept isn't too bad. Um, and the results are considered second order accurate in this case. So even more accuracy and gets at more of the asymmetry that goes along with, uh, with that uncertainty. So here's a, a quick example, right? Um, and I'll actually step through this within SSP and show you how you, we do this within the software, but I just want to visualize for you first and foremost how this happens within SSP. Um, so the I3 algorithm um, relies upon the accuracy of the confidence limits of um, the, the model, right? So Tim Cohn has shown that they're second order accurate, done a lot of work uh, to do that, really, really good work in the past. Beth even had him improve upon that in the past too. So thank you, Beth, because we rely upon them being accurate and efficient. They are um, computed through closed form solutions, so there isn't randomness with them. Um, so they're repeatable, tractable, everything is great with them. Um, we can compute confidence limits, many, many, many confidence limits at various percentiles around the median curve, right? So we can, we can all do that. The typical ones are, you know, the 90% or 95%, or if you're using the uh, PKQ software, that would be the 97.5%, um, but we can compute all those. Right, so as Dave and Beth had, uh, alluded to, or at least Dave alluded to in the beginning, um, those things are accurate in the vertical direction, right? So this is how that uncertainty distribution uh, looks for a specific AEP. Um, um, this information is accurate in the vertical direction, but it's also accurate in the horizontal direction. So we can flip those confidence limits using like a 45 degree line and construct an asymmetrical PDF or a corresponding flow that describes the uncertainty in the horizontal direction, right? Just note that these PDFs aren't to scale. Um, they're not perfect, but that's essentially what we are doing um, in these computations. So we compute things in the vertical direction, we flip it, we do some math along the way, and we integrate underneath that curve to compute expected values at flows of interest, and then we provide output to you within the user interface. So that's what I'm actually gonna show here real quick out of the slides for a second. I'll bring up um, the SSP user interface. So I have a bunch of examples here um, that we can step through for a couple of different unique cases, but the one I want to look at is Carbon Canyon Dam. So if you've ever seen, um, if you've ever seen me present stuff in the past, you know that um, negatively skewed distribution, distributions are, they make me frown. Right, <laughs> they're difficult to deal with, but this one is, is very, very negative in this case, but introduces some interesting tidbits that go along with it. All right, so within the user interface of the Bulletin 17 editor, we've added this new panel at the bottom here, this new option within the, the expected probability curve panel to compute the expected probability curve using numerical integration. By default, that'll be turned off, so this option will be selected, but it's just a quick click to get the expected probability curve uh, computations to be included within your Bulletin 17C uh, methods, all you gotta do is compute from there. A warning is gonna come up if you hit certain considerations, right? So we limit expected probability outputs to the one in a million AEP. We don't go any further out than that because the confidence limits are essentially unbounded at a certain point. APs get really, 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 really small. Um, we never really hit the end of them. Um, so we truncate those results to be at one in a million to increase accuracy. We also can encounter confidence limits that bend over upon themselves, right? So we don't want to do that, or we don't want to include those results as well. Um, we want one value for a given flow 
um, as we go across for a given percentile. So we actually smooth those results there. Um, we're just giving you notes that those things are actually encountered if they were encountered. Um, if you don't hit those, you won't get any warnings or anything like that. Click OK. That's great. On the tabular results tab, now we actually show these uh, results here in the expected probability curve column here. So you can see where they are. And you can see that I truncated them at the one in a million. You can still compute um, confidence limits in, in um, your computed curve past that, but we actually truncate those results there. When you plot your curve, you'll actually see this um, showing up here at the dashed blue line. So you can see how that um, aligns with your, your results. As Beth and Dave alluded to, um, or we'll talk about in the past, the median and computed, or the median and expected probability curve should be equivalent at the median, so the one and two AP. If they don't cross there, if they don't, aren't the same, you know that that's not correct. Something went wrong, either you didn't converge or there was some other mathematical oddities in there. But Dave said it before, the expected probability curve is going to plot to the left or above um, your median curve for AEPs that are less than the median, and it does the exact opposite on the other side. So for AEPs that are more frequent than the median, the expected probability curve is below or to the right of the computed curve. Very, very simple to do this with an SSP. Um, it's just a single radio button that you toggle on and can compute and get output at that point. All right, now I'm gonna kick it over to Beth to give you a little bit of the historical perspective um, during Bulletin 17C development and how it related to expected probability. Um, actually, I don't think there's a whole lot left to add um, beyond what Dave has already said. Um, just that when we were, when the discussion came up, actually before Bulletin 17C, let's say there was debate on expected probability as a concept and the core of engineers behind Dr. Beard um, made it our policy to use it because it is appropriate for the type of analysis that we do. Um, Dave mentioned return on investment and you have to use expected values. We also build infrastructure and if we are specifying a an exceedance probability for a levy, we want the future outcome to actually match the uh, the exceedance probability that we've specified. So if it's a if it's a one percent levy, we want it to be exceeded on average once in a hundred years. And uh, if we had based it on that that computed median curve, it would be exceeded more than that. So for the Corps of Engineers, it was a very good choice to use the expected probability um, theory. Other agencies were not on board. Um, FEMA was not on board with it, and um, they are the other agency where it might have been relevant. Other agencies did not um, did not get on board with expected probability. Uh, so it's in bulletin 17 A and B. Um, I was on the work group um, for the bulletin starting in 2005, and I was the representative for the Corps of Engineers. And at that point, every time expected probability had come up for me answering questions within the Corps, so what I usually answered was, as long as you're using the value off the curve um, without uncertainty, you should be using an expected probability adjustment to the curve, which is no longer a log Pearson type 3 distribution, by the way. Um, but if you're taking the frequency curve into an analysis that does incorporate the uncertainty, at the time it was HEC FDA. Um, the other programs we uh, that Dave mentioned didn't exist yet at that time. Um, if you're going to incorporate that asymmetrical uncertainty, then the median is there and the mean is there and everything is wrapped up in the results. And so you would not use the expected probability adjustment curve. You would use the median curve as your inputs. So when that idea came up in the 17C discussions, uh, or let's say the work group discussions before we had even decided to call it 17C, um, when the idea of expected probability came up, I said, you know, it was really the core that applied this. And at this point, we don't really apply it anymore because our methods have advanced far enough that we can incorporate the entire asymmetrical uncertainty. So I said, you know what, let's just not re, um, let's not have the debate again. Let's, uh, let's just not include it. Or I guess someone else said, let's not include it. And I was fine 
with that. Now, later on, the risk management center was developed and more methods and faster methods that were less computationally expensive needed to be developed. And so a PA analysis, I'm going to let Dave correct me if I'm saying this wrong, but um, a periodic assessment is done with a frequency curve without incorporating the uncertainty. And so that's a place where we really do need our expected probability curve. And so it became relevant again within the Corps of Engineers. And I do wish I had um, remembered, um, saw that need and brought it up again before we finally released 17C in 2018, but we were focused on other things. So um, as for historical context, that's about, that's about what I can say. So it's, I, I, let, me, let me just summarize to say that it's not left out of 17C because it's not the right thing to do. It's left out of 17C because it did not seem to be relevant at the time we decided. It is once again relevant. So maybe 17D will have it again. With the I3. We'll see what the future holds. Yeah, yes. we'll see what the future holds. <laughs> oh, okay, and that, let, me, yeah. let me add one more, one more thing. 17B did have expected probability, and you'd think, hey, can't we just use the expected probability computation from 17B? Um, as both Mike and Dave said, the expected probability computation is based on the uncertainty, uh, all those confidence intervals. And the confidence intervals from 17B were narrower than 17C because they did not... Uh, incorporate the uncertainty in our skew coefficient. So that means the expected probability adjustment from 17B did not adjust far enough. So that is the reason we needed a new method. And Dave and I guess Dana Moses came up with that method and Mike implemented it in 17C. So what you get out of SSP now is going to be a better expected probability adjustment than if you were doing bullets in 17B methods. There. <laughs> now I'm done. Sweet. Thank you, Beth. All right, so just in conclusion, SSP 2.3, the version 2.3, is on our website, um, still in beta, about to release um, soon, and do the official release soon. It does contain an expected probability adjustment that you can use with the expected moments algorithm. The expected probability curve should be used when the uncertainty isn't carried forward into further analyses, right? But if you are using HSC FDA, HSC Watt, and FRA, or RMC RFA, the computed curve or the parameterized distribution itself should be used in lieu of the expected probability curve. That's not needed when you're using those, those applications. Those are the, the presentations that we got today, or the, the slides that we got today. I'd like to open it up to questions for anybody that may have them. This is Anne. If you have any questions, you can either raise your hand and type it in the chat or hear me. Oh, did I have one? Will, is that you? Do you have your hand up? I'm here. Can you hear me? It said my microphone was not on. Okay. You can hear great. you. <laughs> hey, great. Hey, everybody. Thanks so much, um, Dave, Mike, and Beth, for, for a great presentation. Um, I guess not so much a question as a comment, but I'll, I'll take your feedback. The last slide said that in instances when we are not carrying uncertainty forward, we should use the expected curve. Um, I just wanted to point out that under ER 101, when we're communicating risk, um, we should be communicating it with lots of different kinds of um, products that are outlined in the, in the reg. But if for some reason we are, have no choice but to give just one number, um, the number we're supposed to give in that case is actually the 90% assurance value. So that would be the, the upper 90th confidence interval around the median curve. So if you're computing without uncertainty for the purpose of communicating to the public, then I think the best uh, course of action would be to report that 90% value. But if you can, just kick and scream and fight and say, I need to give you five or six different ways of looking at this risk because that's the way that the ER um, is written. It has um, cumulative probabilities and um, assurance values for historical floods and lots of other kinds of things that are helpful for communicating risk. So anyway, that's, that's just my comment, but I'll take any comment feedback from the group if there is any. Uh, I'll make a slight comment. Um, I actually wasn't aware that ER 
said to report that it's a single number, but the upper 90% when you're doing the uncertainty in the vertical direction on that first slide where uh, Dave had showed it in the horizontal direction, um, that is also in, it's based on the same asymmetrical uncertainty distribution around the curve. And so the uh, 90, the uh, what you call, I guess a lower 90% value where there's 10% of the uncertainty above and 90% below, that also is based on the same shaped distribution that expected probability would shift you from the median to the mean. Then that 90% is gonna just be a bit further, but it's based on the same uncertainty distribution. And so while I didn't know about it, that recommendation is not inconsistent with what we're talking about here, which is, um, which is making sure that we uh, account for the asymmetry of the uncertainty distribution and that errors are not symmetrical on both sides. But, um, well, thank you, thank you for pointing it out. Well, this is Tom Gambucci. I've got a question uh, for you, Mike. You, you had um, truncated at one in a million, and I've been on PAs where they requested more than that, uh, they being RMC saying like uh, 10 to the minus eight or something. So I, I don't know, is there like a document now or uh, some guidance that I can point to to say uh, we're only going to one in a million? So if you use an RMC RFA, again, you would be using the parameterized distribution and then the equivalent record length uh, to carry forth uncertainty computations. However, what you need to do one in only one and you do need to provide one in 10 million, one in 100 million. Um, AP, let's talk. I can be lenient in those computations and give you a version of SSP that actually does compute that for you. However, in the slide that I showed earlier, you see where all the confidence limits were, were plotted along with the, the median. You see that they essentially bend over and they're almost unbounded on that side for negatively skewed distributions. That's what we're trying to avoid in this case. Um, you, we really start to uh, <laughs> have to make some assumptions there in terms of probabilities that go into the actual computations. But give me a call, talk to me about it, specific uh, examples, yeah. and I'll, I'll work up a solution with you. All right, thank you. Yep. Did we do that good of a job explaining the concept to everybody? Nobody has any questions? This was massively confusing to me the first time that I saw it working at the Philly district. All right, go ahead, Brett. Yeah, hey guys. So, um, wasn't following everything exactly, but I'm wondering, you know, what if we're doing a study, like say we're just doing, uh, we get asked to do just a flow frequency study for a number of gauges in a watershed. Um, traditionally, you know, in reports I've seen in our district, we'll just compute the computed curve and we'll show that the 90% confidence limits and that's what we'll report. So is that wrong? Like, should we be reporting the expected probability curve instead? Or I guess I'm just trying to wrap my head around what, you know. If... I'd suggest also instead of instead. Yeah, I agree. If you, I mean, if you're doing a, you know, a general purpose flood frequency study that's gonna, you know, go in the library for others to use for whatever purposes they might want to use it for or need to use it for. I would, I, I would always um, report both. And actually, it's probably it's actually three things. I would you would, you know I would always report the the computed curve, the expected curve, and the confidence intervals. Okay. Thanks. Yep, yep. That way, that way it's there, right? And and depending on how someone is going to use it, right? It it accommodates the information they need for whatever method or type of analysis they're going to use it for. Will, I see, is your hand still up or is it up again? It's up again. I, I want to put Matt Dirksen on the spot because I think he originally instigated this. Uh, this webinar. So um, thanks to him that we are having this discussion here today, but um, I think he doesn't get off that easy. So, all right, well, it might, might be multitasking, but I think 
the the question was about a relative comparison of of locations. So if you have uh, locations along a river system, and people are trying to understand which is at greatest risk, um, which curve would be the more appropriate one? And my gut reaction is it doesn't matter. But um, I, I'll turn it over to the experts. What do you think? I would I would say in in principle it it would be the expected curve, um, and just the the simple way. I would explain why is if you look at uh, maybe if Mike, if you can go back to one of your examples, if you look at the examples there, the 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 distance, say notionally, the distance between the expected curve and the computed curve is not a constant, right? It it's depending on where you are on the on the AEP spectrum, it it varies. So if you have two sites that have different. Um, Different, I mean, whatever it might be, let's maybe simply say it's levy overtopping, right? If they have different frequencies, um, you theoretically could get a different answer with the expected curve than the computed curve, and the expected curve would be more appropriate. But in practice, you know, unless the differences in AEP are quite large, in, in which case it might be obvious which one's highest risk, right? The, the differences, you know, the APs aren't that far apart. The differences probably aren't that big, and you probably get a similar outcome most of the time doing it either way. But if you want it to be fail safe, um, you know, just in case, the expected curve would be the the more appropriate one to use. I would also add that um, the distance between the expected curve and the original computed median curve is dependent on the uncertainty, which is dependent on the record length. So if you had two sites and one had a short record length and a lot of uncertainty in the curve and one had a really long record length goes back to, you know, gauge from the early 1900s, um, the short record length um, frequency estimate, you're going to move a lot further to the expected probability curve than you would move in the other. And so I think, um, Will, you might have implied that, you know, if you're only looking at relative, one's going to be higher than the other either way. But if the record length is very different, they might actually switch places with the move to expected probability. So that might just be a, a small wrinkle. Whereas if they're similar, then then um, the relative difference will probably be the same. And and what um, what Dave said, it's probably right. Yeah, that's a really good point. This case may be a little bit um, of an extreme example. So we have paleo flood information that we've included within here. I think this record length, the historical, the entire complete historical time period that we're analyzing in this analysis here is like several thousand years. So um, that's not always the case, right? If we're analyzing sites that have varying record lengths between 20 and 60 and 70 and whatever number of years, um, the expected probability curve is the one to use because that incorporates the record lengths exactly as Beth said and gives you an apples to apples comparison. If the record lengths are all the same, Maybe you could get away with comparing the computed curves. I'd be interested to see how that works, to be honest. Um, the shape of the distribution also impacts that, right? The closer you are to a log normal fit or skew is equal to zero, um, you would have different behavior than if you're wildly positive or negatively skewed. So um, let me know how that goes. Expected probability would be the one to use in that case, what I would recommend using, but that is an interesting question. Good questions. Keep them coming. Imagining a what if. Okay, so what if you had a project and you reported the computed curve and things have kind of gone on, you're maybe in feasibility, you're form formulating your plan alternatives and doing the initial economics. I mean, at some point, I mean, you probably want to bring up that the expected curve wasn't used or perhaps look at the difference between them and see if it's a big deal. But that could be a question that somebody in on the call would have, you know, just like, okay, oh my gosh, what do I do now? <laughs> what would your be would be would be your advisement? How do you back paddle or communicate um, that maybe we should be looking at a little different curve? Yeah, that's always a tough one for me because I, you know, my one of my weaknesses is once I see it, I can't unsee it. <laughs> Right. So it's like once you know, you can't unknow it. So 
So what do you do about it? And you know, if if you're in, you know, if you're in quite a pickle, you know, you could you could conceivably go in and say, okay, I'm at least going to do enough analysis to convince myself and others, right? You convince reviewers and approvers and et cetera, et cetera, right? But convince myself that I can demonstrate that it doesn't matter for this particular application, right? So at, at a minimum, I would do that, right? I would go in and say, okay, you know, the trains left the station, but now I know this, I gotta do something, right? I can't do, I can't not do anything. So, um, you know, at least convince myself that it's, it's not going to make a difference and then in all future applications make the make the transition but um but if if there's any any opportunity where there's enough time to make the adjustment i would i would make the adjustment and change course even if it means having to ask for a little bit more time or or money i think it would in the long run i think that's the preferred option unless you're really you know unless you're really backed into a corner right and you have no other option then i think it would be okay to uh, show that it doesn't make a difference and, and document it that way the question that uh, came in from corby um you want to say it out loud for everybody corby i'm answering in the chat okay i was gonna yeah, say sure. Beth is gonna be your best bet on this one she's the master of Empirical distribution uncertainty. You know what? I just actually lost most of what I had typed into the chat because I moved them out. So that is a great question on um, on whether to have a similar adjustment for the graphical frequency curve. And uh, currently, the way we do uncertainty around a graphical frequency curve does use a normal distribution in the end. We have a more sophisticated way of coming up with the standard deviation, the width of the uncertainty, but then we slap a normal distribution around it. So it's symmetrical, and so the mean and median is currently the same. So we would not get an adjustment. But as we improve, and we've been needing to improve how we do uncertainty around graphical curves. So as we improve the description of uncertainty around graphical curves, um, I will I will keep in mind that um, coming up with an expected probability version of that is probably something we should be thinking about. And I, I, I love that you brought it up. And I will I will keep it in in mind along with the others working on graphical curve. But yeah, thanks, Corby. Yeah, I think if you look at um, that ER I referenced, um, I think there's a statement in there that says there's there's no adjustment to be made for the graphical curve, and I think it's for the reasons Beth gave and with the methods that were and I guess still are in use, it, it wouldn't make a difference. But, you know, going forward, right, maybe there's some, uh, you know, maybe there's opportunities to, there to move is. that, to move that forward. Right? Yeah, the uncertainty really is asymmetrical. It's just that we have a very difficult time describing it. And the, the compromise was to just figure out the width and then use the normal distribution. But it really is asymmetrical. And so if when, right. once we're doing that better, we will, we can make that adjustment. Yeah, so that, I mean, there are we can do it now. Right. Yeah, there there are techniques out there um, to do to do that for a non-parametric or graphical curve. Um, we just they're just not codified in our in our policy, or, or I don't think in our in the tools that I referenced earlier yet. So. They haven't really been adequate yet, but we will make them. Adequate. I ask a question about that of you, Beth. Um, and some work that we've been doing recently for regulated and unregulated frequency analysis, right? So we could take a regulated time series, unregulate it, right, through whether period of record simulation um, to actually take out unregulated uh, or take out the, the effects of regulation, then an analytical distribution to that data, and then convert it back to a regulated um, flood, frequency uh, flood frequency curve. Can we do the same thing to the expected probability curve? That's a good uncertainty point. Around that? That's a good point. So you could... Um get your unregulated curve and do the expected probability adjustment and then transform the expected probability curve instead of the median curve to your regulated. So yeah, that that is a good idea. Granted, that's, that's still using the curve itself perfect, and not the answer. Yeah, this is in a perfect world where the effects yeah, of regulation are very 
well defined and not all and, and you can do a transform right yeah yeah, yeah. 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 So, yeah. so yeah so you, you can definitely do it that way in in one step right if you just want a single answer but you could and, and i think fda does this right you can yes. you know you can put in uh you could put in your um computed curve with the effective record length right and and you know, essentially do a little Monte Carlo that models the uncertainty and does the, and then include the transform. And you can even, I don't think FDA does uncertainty in the transform, but it's, it's trivial. Yeah, it does. To implement. It does. And you, I, I've, uh, in one FDA of our damn safety, yeah, one of our damn safety studies, it was a concern. So I helped someone, I mean, it took us, we did it in less than an hour. You can build a spreadsheet to, to do that. Um, it's really, really easy to do. So if folks run into those situations, you know, you can reach out to any of us for suggestions on how you can do that if there's a specific, you know, if there's not a specific tool that currently does it for you. Um, FDA does do uncertainty in the transform, but also FDA is using the uncertainty. So you don't explicitly use an expected probability curve because you've got a Monte Carlo of all the uncertainty. And so you're just randomly sampling curves and transforming them. Um, and then I, Mike's, Mike's suggestion was when you're not doing Monte Carlo and you do need one curve, that that suggestion of transforming the expected probability unregulated curve instead of the computed unregulated curve would be a way, if you could do it with a transform, that's simply inflow to outflow, regulated to unregulated, oops, unregulated to regulated. That's one way without a Monte Carlo. Yes, Get exactly. It. For sure. Started. That's a good idea today. Uh, Grab the discussion on this one. This this has got me. My brain is turning now. I need to do an example and put that on our uh, on our website and tutorials and guides for an example how to do this. Regulated to unregulated, and back to regulated flow frequency is a big big topic right now. I don't know if that's exactly what you you were getting at, Corby, but that got my brain turning here. I would love to investigate that a little bit further. If anybody is interested, in working with us on that. Awesome. Um, I'm looking for additional hands. I know we're kind of getting to the end of the window that we had specified for time. If there's anything quick, let's pull it in real fast. Scanning. And the discussion doesn't have to end now, too. If you have a question later on, please feel free to email any of us. Um, we'll get back to you. Well, I want to say a huge thank, thank you to the three of you for jumping on this call. When we had a question pop up from a few different offices, it just seemed like the time was right to hit that nail on the head and, and try to get that conversation opened up so we all understand it better. We had over 66 people on this call at one point, and so obviously there's a lot of interest, and in that distribution came from MVD and a few friends um, stemming from that coordination. But I want to thank you all for jumping on here over your late lunch to learn more about this and thank our expert panel on, on making us smarter today. So um, with that, we will log off, but um, we hope you have a great afternoon and we'll get some of these recordings posted up before too long. Thanks again, everyone. Really appreciate your attention and thanks for having us, Sam. Take care. Yay. Everybody. Yes. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Bye.